inviting me to, uh, to give this, uh, this presentation. So I really look forward to, to getting to know the, the local community uh, working on, uh, on heat transport, nanoscale heat transport. So I'm, I'm very excited to be here and be at a real physical uh, event. That's also very nice. And it's also the first time I'm at Alba after many years in Spain. Uh, it's nice to finally uh, get to be uh, here at the synchrotron. Okay, so uh, I would like to talk about uh, three different uh, topics. So the first one uh, is uh, phonon heat transport uh, in 2D materials, especially TMDs. The second topic is not about phonon heat transport, but about electron heat transport, in particular in, in graphene. And I will show you that it can have extremely high uh, diffusivity, these electrons. And in the third part, if, if I have enough time to reach it, uh, I would like to show you a little a new technique that we developed that we can use to study uh, heat diffusion of phonons uh, sort of in, in real time and space. So this is spatiotemporal uh, microscopy technique. Okay, so let's start with the, with the first topic. Um, so first I have to acknowledge my coworkers. So these are uh, the people at ICN2. So the people in my group, and also the people in the group of Clivia uh, Sotomayor Torres, and also uh, the group of Sergio and Pablo. Uh, we had theory support from Mathieu and Zela. Uh, there's also people from ICFO involved, and also uh, one person from Israel. And I should also acknowledge this, this funding. Okay, so the idea really is to, to, um, to see what happens in 2D materials and how is this different from 3D bonded materials uh, in terms of heat transport in this case. So we kind of want to compare what happens in a 3D bonded silicon uh, system compared to uh, a TMD, transition metal dichrocogonite, like NYC2, which uh, is really uh, in plane strongly bonded, but out of plane very weakly interacting only through Van der Waals forces. So the idea is to see what, what's different in them. So one can make uh, these kind of uh, suspended films of silicon uh, down to around nine nanometers, for instance, in this paper. And, and the same can be done um, with these TMDs, but you can go even thinner. So this is actually a sample that we made in my group and it's a monolayer MOSC2. So it's 0.6 nanometers thick. So it's an order of magnitude thinner than such 3D bonded system. That's one thing that's nice about it. What you also see is that here you have all this corrugation because of, of strain that relaxes. In this case, we also have this, but we can also get rid of it by a simple annealing step. So we can really get a very flat, uh, a nice, uh, a thin film uh, and do our measurements of thermal transport on these films. So in the case of silicon, um, what people have seen is that if you start with uh, quite thick, you get bulk like thermal transport. In the case of silicon, uh, the thermal conductivity is quite high, but then when you make it thinner and thinner, the thermal conductivity keeps going down more and more. That's because of the scattering at the surface. Um, and it's really more than an order of magnitude uh, uh, lower in the case of a 10 nanometer film. So according to, to this phenomenological theory, it keeps going down even more. So the question is with these very thin TMD films, we can access this regime of even thinner films. So will it keep going down? That's one thing one could uh, ask oneself. Um, people have already asked themselves this question and they came up with the following experimental results, which kind of looks like there's a trend of going down towards thinner and then maybe something going up again which could be the case because in graphene, we know that it, that it goes up right towards the monolayer. Um, so these are experimental results in terms of uh, theoretical results. Um, this is the case for MOSC2, so monodamin diselenide. There's only uh, bulk-like uh, simulations or monolayer. There's not so much uh, in between that we could find. And one could imagine that maybe there's the same trend, but then we would be ignoring this data point. So it's not very clear what's really going on if you make this material much thinner. So we might wanted to uh, answer this question of what happened. So we started making these samples. I already showed you this one. Um, we also characterize them. What you see from a TEM is that we have very nice crystalline flakes. So we do this by exfoliation and then dry transfer uh, onto a, a substrate with a 50 micron diameter hole. Um, we also did AFM measurements and we see that uh, on the suspended region were even flatter than on the supported region. That's because here you see some of the roughness of just the substrate. Uh, on the suspended part, we're flatter than, than a nanometer, even, even much less than a nanometer. So it's, it's extremely flat, very clean surfaces. Uh, and we really know that we have a monolayer uh, because uh, we can see very strong photoluminescence, which is a very strong indication that you have a monolayer. Then a bilayer, we have less photoluminescence and then 
uh, even the trilayer, we can resolve the photoluminescence, which usually is quite difficult to do. Uh, but because it's suspended, um, you actually can see even the third, uh, the trilayer photoluminescence. Okay, so we have very nice samples and that are very clean and very uh, monocrystalline. And we're going to now study uh, in plane heat transport using a quite standard technique. Some of you in the room are probably expert on this technique, so I can go quite fast. The idea is that you shine a laser in the center of your suspended region. This heats up the lattice, and then um, the heat starts spreading in plane towards a heat sink where the uh, material is in contact with the substrate. And in our case, we gold coated our, our substrates to make sure that this is a very good heat sink. Um, and then uh, what we uh, do is we measure the steady state temperature that, uh, that comes about after we do this continuous heating. And then as a probe of our temperature, we use this Raman mode, uh, this A1G mode uh, centered around here. This is a calibration measurement where we just increase the temperature of the whole system. And we see that this mode shifts to the red. Now we can also do this instead of by changing the temperature um, by changing the whole sample, we can uh, heat up with this laser. And we also see that the temperature changes because we see uh, the same redshift. So we can extract the temperature induced by this laser heating of our uh, TMD flame. And then we can extract uh, the thermal conductivity using this uh, equation, um, which has the uh, increase in temperature as a function of uh, applied power. There's the thickness of the flake in there. There's the size of the hole. So that's the 15 micron diameter of the, of the suspended region. And then also the spot size is very important uh, to go in there. And then there's one more geometrical factor, uh, which in our case turns out to be very close to one. So we can pretty much ignore it. So with this, we can, uh, from these kind of power uh, dependent uh, Raman shift measurements, extract uh, our thermal conductivity in our sample. Uh, but before we can do this, uh, it's really important to emulate certain uh, artifacts related to the substrate. So this is something that we find out while we started doing these measurements. And one of these artifacts is what I already mentioned, the fact that it really helps to gold coat your substrate. And here you see the difference. If we do gold coat them, we get this uh, slope. So this is the uh, temperature increase, which we extract from the Raman shift as a function of absorbed power uh, in the substrate, uh, in, the, in the sample, so in our MOSC2. Um, and this is the case if we don't have the gold coated substrate. So it's not that suddenly the thermal conductivity of the MOSC2 is different. It's just that in the case where you do not gold coat your substrate, this equation is lo no longer valid because this is only valid if you have a perfect heat sink at the edge of your suspended uh, uh, region. Um, so of course one can uh, you know, take this into account, but it means you have to introduce a lot more variables, which means you introduce a lot more uncertainty. So by doing this gold coating, you can remove this complication, remove this artifact and get a much more reliable uh, thermal conductivity. Uh, so this is in the case of 17 layers. Um, and here I show you how this actually uh, looks like as a function of thickness. So if you don't gold coat, the difference is largest for the thicker films than for the thinner films, uh, which, which we understand um, because um, for thicker films, uh, it's more difficult to, to actually reach the heat sink because you also need some out of plane transport. Uh, there's another uh, artifact and that is related to the hole size. So here I show the results for uh, five micron holes and here for 10 and 50 microns. So for 10 and 50 microns, we're on the same slope, but for five microns, we're on a different slope. So in this case, we think the artifact is mostly related to the fact that you're clipping a little bit of your incident laser beam in this whole size. So we're not getting the accurate number for the absorption uh, in the film. And that's one of the main parameters that goes into extracting this thermal conductivity. And so it's important to have gold coated samples with a large diameter. That's, that's the conclusion. And then we can actually do these measurements for the whole range of thicknesses. So we go from, uh, from one layer all the way up to 70 layers. Uh, I should mention that some of these thicknesses, we also measured two or three or four times on different samples, just to see how well it reproduces. So we have four bilayers, we have two monolayers, two trilayers, um, and we see that the reproducibility is actually very good. Um, so what you see here is that it basically scales very nicely uh, with thickness. So the thicker it is, the more uh, it's on the right, so you need more power to heat up your system the same amount, which makes complete sense because you're dumping the same amount of power in a, in a larger volume, so you get less heating. Uh, so that's just the effect of the thickness, uh, because this is just the, the, the temperature increase that we're showing here. Um, we can then uh, correct for this thickness by multiplying by the thickness. 
So in that way, we basically uh, are plotting this slope multiplied by this thickness. So this thing is a constant and this alpha is a constant. We're basically plotting something that is representing already the thermal conductivity. And just by looking at these raw data, you can already see that there's not a very strong effect of the thickness of your MOSC2 flake. So the thermal conductivity does not change a lot when you change the thickness all the way from a monolayer, so sub nanometer thickness, all the way up to 70 uh, layers, which is, which is around 50 nanometers. So there's a weak effect of thickness. Now we can, of course, uh, quantify this uh, using this equation, and you see this. So um, you see that it's, it's very constant, up to around 30 layers. And then for the, for the thickest one, which you call bolt-like, uh, it increases uh, maybe a factor two or something. So the most striking thing is that it's really quite flat around here. And here you can also see the spread when we measure different samples or measure the same sample twice. So these, for instance, are two different bio, uh, two different monolayers and four different uh, bilayers uh, shown here. So you see that the spread is quite, is quite small. So this means that both the sample reproducibility and the measurement reproducibility is quite high. So really, there's not much of an effect of the thickness, which is very different from what we saw uh, earlier um, from these works on 3D bonded silicon, where you see this, this dramatic uh, decrease of almost two orders of magnitude uh, when you go to thinner films, where here at most we see a factor two. Um, so I don't know if you can see it with the beamer color, but if we would plot a little trend here, which is like a factor two, that would show up somewhere, somewhere here in this other graph. So it's really a much smaller effect in this layered system than what you see in, uh, in silicon. So in order to understand this in more detail, we did up initial calculations. And with our theoretical collaborators. And what's quite interesting about that is that's a, a new way of doing up initial calculations where you get the phonon properties at room temperature. So not at zero Kelvin, but really at 300K. Uh, and the results are here. So uh, one other thing about that is that it's based on siesta calculations. So that means you can do many atoms. So we're not restricted to either doing monolayer or bulk. You can also do bilayer, trilayer, and up to six layers. So computation time increases, but it's still quite doable uh, to measure a six layer MOSC2 film and get the thermal conductivity. And what you see is that um, they're very close to the experimental values. They're, they're, they're slightly higher, um, but quite a, quite a small difference. And in the bulk uh, range, they're very close. So the trend is very much the same for the experimental uh, results and the theoretical results. So this means that we quite well understand uh, the system and we can now look at the physical insights that we get from these up initial uh, uh, calculation simulations. And actually there is something surprising because it's not that nothing changes in this MOSC2 film when you go to monolayer. A lot of things change, both in electronic uh, band structure, which we all know, but also in the phononic band structure. And so the modes, uh, dispersion, still very different. And, and then uh, what I plot here is the, uh, the, the spectrally decomposed thermal uh, connectivity. So from that, you can see which are the frequencies uh, and the modes at that frequency that carry most of the heat. And what you see here for bulk, for instance, that's the dark uh, blue, purple-like uh, color, there's a very large contribution to the thermal conductivity carried by modes around one terahertz. So this is not one mode, but this is actually a few, uh, both acoustic and optical modes uh, uh, centered around one terahertz. And that contribution quite quickly goes down when you go to thinner films. That's because you're losing some of the modes because these are mostly uh, interlayer modes. So you have fewer of them, the fewer layers you have. And also some lifetimes are, are decreasing when you uh, thin uh, the, the, the crystal. So that's the effect that this is going down. Um, but this is compensated by the fact that here at very low frequency, you have a very large increase when you go towards the monolayer. So for the monolayer, you have a very large contribution of heat carrying mode uh, at around 0.1 terahertz. So this is a flexural, uh, um, uh, acoustic-like uh, mode uh, centered uh, at, at quite low frequency, but it can carry quite a lot of heat because also, of course, the heat capacity is, is lower at these lower frequencies. So the fact that we see this very small change of thermal conductivity as a function of thickness is a quite coincidental effect where you have these modes compensating each other in terms of the heat that they carry uh, uh, for the lattice. So we thought that was quite interesting. Um, and I can also show here um, what this means in terms of the, the, the mean-free path. 
distribution. So this is a, a cumulative distribution. So what you see is that for the thicker films, uh, not that much changes, um, but especially for the mono layer, you have a lot of uh, heat carried by modes that have a very long mean free path. So if you look at the numbers, this is one micron. So almost half of the heat is carried by a mode that has a mean free path of a micron, which is quite striking because you have sub nanometer thickness of your film, but the heat is carried by modes that have a mean free path of one micron. And it also shows that it's really important uh, to have a large hole radius because we had 15 microns. If you do this with a one or two micron hole size, you're clipping uh, in a way the mean free path of the funnel mode, which can affect your thermal conductivity that you end up with. So it's important to, to do this on, on large uh, holes. Um, so that's basically the conclusion of the, of the in-plane uh, thermal transport. Um, but there's also a funny effect of, of out-of-plane uh, heat uh, dissipation, which I would like to show here, uh, which is when you change from doing these measurements in vacuum to going in air. So I think this in the community, this has been known for quite a while that it's important to do these Raman thermometry measurements, not in air, but in vacuum, because you can see a small difference. Uh, what I will show you is that the thinner you make your film, the larger this difference becomes. Um, and it's quite dramatic. So indeed you see perhaps a small difference if you do this at five or 10 or 30 layers. But if you go towards the mono layer, there's almost an order of magnitude increase in the apparent thermal conductivity that you extract. So I call it an apparent thermal conductivity because it's no longer a real clean in-plane thermal conductivity uh, as you extract using that equation for kappa because now there's also a parallel channel of out-of-plane heat dissipation to air. So in a way you should uh, adapt this equation which we actually already also did. Um, but yeah, you can also call this an, an apparent uh, thermal conductivity and it actually reaches a very high value similar to what you get for silicon uh, thermal conductivity, the similar value. So one can argue that, okay, it's not a real thermal conductivity, which is true, um, but it does kind of represent the amount of heat dissipation you can get in such a film, because for thermal management, you don't care whether it's moving in plane or out of plane, you just care about dissipating the heat. Um, and that this combined system of a monolayer MOSC2 together with air actually does, so it quite efficiently dissipates the heat. Um, so this is the summary of this part of the talk. So this is this effect of the out of plane heat dissipation to air. And this is the, the re theoretical and experimental results of the in-plane uh, thermal conductivity as a function of thickness. Okay, so I'd like to go now to the second part of my talk, which is quite a bit different. So in this case, we're looking at uh, graphene. So it's also a 2D material system, also a layered material. Um, but now I'm gonna look at the electronic uh, heat uh, diffusion. So here I also have to thank some collaborators, so people at, uh, at ICM2, uh, theory support from the uh, University of Manchester. Um, the work uh, was uh, done when I was still, uh, well, it started when I was still at ICFO, and we got our core nitro examples for our Japanese uh, collaborators. So, okay, I will go very quickly over this because I think most of you know this, but graphene has all these very fancy uh, properties such as uh, high mobility, tunable carrier density, so you can really move the Fermi energy from below the Dirac point to the Dirac point and above the Dirac point. So going from whole doping to electron doping. And the way you do this is you have a electronic gate underneath your graphene separated by an insulator. So you apply a voltage to this gate and that changes the Fermi energy of your electron system of the graphene above. It. Okay. Now, another thing that's very special about graphene um, is the fact that you get very efficient light induced heating. So if you shine light on graphene um, very quickly you heat up the electronic system without immediately heating up the phonon system. So you have a small amount of time where you decouple the electronic system from the phononic system in terms of, of thermodynamics. Um, so the reason for this is the following. So this is something we started studying already many years ago. So if you do photo excitation of graphene, you create one hole here in the valence band, let's say one electron here in the conduction band. Now within tens of femtoseconds, you get electron-electron interaction within uh, your band. And that basically uh, promotes electrons from the Fermi C to a slightly higher energy. If you then plot this on a, on a, on a electron, uh, on an on a energy uh, horizontal scale, what you see is that if you start out at room temperature, you have a Fermi drug distribution that is this blue curve. You have injected some electrons here in the conduction band and some holes here in the valence band. Then if you let the system evolve just for a few tens of femtoseconds, so it's very quick, 
you end up with this red curve, which is a broadened Fermi drug distribution. In other words, you have increased the electron temperature from room temperature to something uh, that is higher. And this is not just me drawing this. This is an actual uh, complete uh, semi-classical simulation of the full electron dynamics in the system. So going from this initial state, which is the blue curve, into this, this red curve. So that's something we published a few years ago. So bottom line is you shine light on graphene, you get electronic heat. So this broad and Fermi dark distribution. And that's very interesting for many applications, such as data communication, photo detection. <coughs> uh, but that, what I will uh, try to convince you uh, today is that it's also interesting for thermal transport, for heat transport. Um, and of course, we know that graphene is interesting for heat transport, but that's always based on the phonons. Of graphene because uh, this is this review paper in nature materials where as a function of a number of uh, layers in graphene you get this increase in thermal conductivity and it goes up uh, to quite high values so so in the order of a few thousand watt per meter kelvin comparing this to the 20 uh, we get for mos 2 this is yeah quite quite a bit higher two orders of magnitude higher so it's very efficient at, at moving heat in plane and that's of course interesting for avoiding uh, your computer chip looking like this. And um, what I will show you now is that also in the electronic system, we can actually move large amounts of heat uh, uh, using graphene. And so for that, we'll uh, use a, a newly developed spatial temporal thermoelectric microscopy technique, with femtosecond temporal resolution and nanometer spatial accuracy. And I will show you uh, what we thought were quite some surprising results. And you can find this on archive and it's now also online at Nature Nano. Um, so this is the device that we study. So it looks a little bit complicated, but it's, it's not too bad. So it's basically a whole bar channel of graphene. So we have the two uh, channels here and also the side channels. That means we can do whole measurements so we can really extract very accurately uh, the mobility of the electron system and also the carrier density. We do not have one of these gates to tune the Fermi energy, but we have two of them. So we can separately change the Fermi energy in this part of the channel and in this part of the channel. And that's important because that allows us to generate the PN junction. So we apply a negative voltage on one side, a positive voltage on the other. So that uh, generates a, a PN junction such that we can create a photothermoelectric signal here at the interface. That's the idea. So the way this works is the following. So we're also gonna use uh, light. So this is the first uh, ultra short laser pulse that we use. It's absorbed in the graphene, where it then, within tens of femtoseconds, generates this uh, hot electron distribution, uh, which starts spreading in plane. We do the same uh, with a second laser pulse, but on the other side uh, of the PN junction, which also generates electron heat, which also starts spreading. And at some point, those two spreading heat uh, uh, pulses will meet at the interface, and there they will generate a photocurrent. So, of course, each of the pulses will generate a photocurrent, but because there's a nonlinearity in this, we can also focus only on the interacting heat that is generated at, at this junction. So, the way we do this is we modulate this one with one frequency, we modulate the other one with another frequency, and we look at the differential frequency. So, only the signal that is then generated by the heat of one pulse having an effect on the heat of the other pulse. So, we're really looking purely at the interacting heat generated photocurrent. And this happens to this photothermoelectric uh, effect because you have a different Zeebeck coefficient on the, on the two parts of the channel because you have a different formula. Okay, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna vary uh, both the time delay between these two laser pulses and also the spatial uh, offset between them. So this is why we call this a spatial temporal technique because we're changing both a temporal uh, delay and a, a spatial offset. And that is the, the, the really crucial thing, because that is what allows you to measure uh, and see diffusion happening. The fact that you change both uh, yeah, time and space. And you get access to diffusivity in a very direct way, because you can basically see diffusion uh, yeah, as a function of time spreading out in space. That's the idea. And actually, you see that here. So here we're plotting uh, this uh, interacting heat generated photocurrent. That's the color scale as a function of pulse delay and spatial offset. And uh, in white, we also plot here the full width half max of this pulse. So you see that it's slightly broader at longer delay than here in the center. So you see an effect of heat spreading already in this, in this graph. So uh, you see that here also, if you take a cut, 
through here at time zero and a cut a later delay, you see that heat is, is spreading. Um, we can also plot um, a measure of the width. So we use here this, uh, this, this second order uh, uh, correlation to, to characterize the width of this, uh, of this signal. And you see that the width as a function of time increases. And that is a pure uh, diffusion process. So you just see it spreading out in space. Um, and we can actually compare this uh, with what is expected uh, for this system because we know very well the mobility. So for an electrical mobility using wiedemann franz law, you can predict exactly what you expect for the, for the thermal diffusivity, provided that it's purely the electrons that are carrying your heat. Um, and you can actually, so you can use wiedemann franz law um, or Einstein relation that in the end boil down to the same equation, which is this, I think, quite elegant one where you just have Fermi energy mobility and your uh, electronic charge. And we can actually uh, use our measured uh, uh, mobility from the exact same sample because we have this whole bar so we can measure the mobility um, which we did here so for these three different Fermi energies which are the same Fermi energies we plot here uh, we can extract uh, this mobility from the mobility we can predict a thermal diffusivity which is here on the order of 2000 centimeters squared per second uh, you can also uh, plot it as a function of momentum relaxation time and that's going to be an important parameter. And that shows you that in our system, we have a momentum relaxation time of around 300, 400 femtoseconds. So that means that these electrons are interacting at a time scale of tens of femtoseconds, but it takes a few hundred femtoseconds before they start scattering with photons. So they actually have a lot of time uh, to move around while only interacting with the electrons. Okay, so what happens if we plot these diffusivities that we extract here in our uh, data? Actually, it matches quite well. So these lines I plot here are a full simulation of the experiment. So not just plotting uh, the, the diffusivity, which would be a straight line, but we actually simulate the whole photocurrent nonlinear uh, experiment. Uh, but actually, uh, in the initial uh, time delays, even if you would just plot your uh, your theoretical diffusivity-based uh, heat spreading, so that's just your diffusivity multiplied by your time delay. Um, you already see that it matches uh, matches quite well. But um, I will come to some some surprising thing in here. Uh, but first, I would like to uh, show that you can, from these diffusivities, of course, calculate a thermal conductivity by using the heat capacity. And uh, we know that for phonons, it's a few thousand watt per millikelvin. Uh, for the electron system, we find uh, around 100 watt per millikelvin. So this confirms that indeed in graphene, normally, most heat is carried by the photon system. Um, and we also show that this number we get here is quite close to, for instance, this theory work um, of, the, of the, uh, the, the thermal conductivity of graphene of the pure electronic system. So it is lower. But there is something uh, of a catch here. And that is this, this big offset at time zero, um, which we really carefully uh, explored that it's not purely a artifact on a measurement. And it's also not just some ballistic heat spreading in the initial uh, time. And, and we also see that it seems to depend on the Fermi energy because that initial starting point is even higher uh, for the, for the uh, case where we have a lower Fermi energy. So there might be uh, something interesting going on there. Um, and that is uh, related to the fact that we're in the hydrodynamic window. So I think yesterday, this was already mentioned for the phonon system, but for electrons, you can have a hydrodynamic window. And this occurs exactly in this regime where you have this fast electron-electron interaction but slower electron phonon interaction. So we have a small time scale where the electron electron interaction of 10 femtoseconds has already passed, but we're not yet in a regime of the electron phonon interaction of a few hundred femtoseconds. So these are called the hydrodynamic time window. And in this very uh, middle part, in this graph, we're in this hydrodynamic uh, window. So I think I can go over this part quite quickly because probably most of you know it. Um, but just, just for completeness, um, there are different transport regimes. So you can have a diffusive regime where your electron is moving around and then every now and then it scatters with an impurity or a phonon or with other particles. You can also be in the ballistic regime where you have a very small system where you don't have time to scatter with phonons or impurities, but instead you scatter with the boundary of your system. So that's the ballistic regime where you move in straight lines. Uh, yeah, this diffusive regime Einstein equation, wiedemann franz law uh, are obeyed and uh, you have this mean free path uh, 
type of picture. Here, instead of a mean free path, your relevant length scale is just the, the size of your system. Now, you also have this hydrodynamic regime where the most important length scale is actually, or time scale, is the interaction between the electrons. Um, and that is shown uh, schematically by these very large electron, uh, yeah, like billiard balls, um, which shows that the first thing an electron sees is not an electron. So they're bumping into each other. And you can imagine that if you want to move this stuff around, it's like moving water, you know, it's very strongly interacting. So it's like viscous flow of an electron system, um, which has been studied uh, since uh, a few years. Uh, because there's not that many systems where you can actually study hydrodynamic transport of electrons. Turns out graphene is one of those systems where you can study this. Uh, so you need to go to low temperature, very clean systems, and you can see this type of flow of electrons that reminds you of like water spraying into a, into a hot tub where you get these like whirlpools of charges flowing uh, in opposite directions, which is very unintuitive for normal electron flow, but this is something that you can get in the case of hydrodynamic uh, electron flow. This has been studied uh, quite a bit uh, in the last few years. And um, now within this hydrodynamic regime, we have two sub regimes. One is the Fermi liquid regime, which happens uh, at relatively high doping. And then you have a quantum critical phase, which is the Dirac fluid, which occurs uh, very close to the Dirac point, which is a situation where you have both electrons and holes coexisting. And, and the higher you go in electron temperature, the larger uh, this regime becomes. And that is because of course your Fermi drug distribution is broader and broader, the higher you go in electron temperature. So it's easier to have the simultaneous occurrence of both holes in the valence band and electrons in the, in the conduction band. Um, also, this has been studied. Um, so in a very small range of temperatures and uh, carrier density and an extremely clean uh, graphene, uh, the group of Philip Kim at Columbia University a few years ago showed um, a violation of the minimum Franz law. So what actually happens is, is in that small regime, you get a transport of electronic heat that is faster than the actual electronic charge is spreading. So heat can move faster than charge. And that is because the electrons and holes uh, are moving in the same direction along a thermal gradient, whereas in an electrical gradient, they're moving in opposite directions. So they're not carrying much charge, but they can carry a lot of uh, heat. So um, this uh, brings us back to our, our experiment, because in our case, we actually have full control over both these parameters. So we can see if we can actually get into this uh, Dirac fluid quantum critical regime. And because we can control uh, through the gate voltage, this horizontal axis, so we can get very close to the drug point, changing our Fermi energy. And we can tune our laser power with which we're increasing the electronic temperature of our system. So we can map out this full two dimensional phase space um, using our, uh, our photocurrent uh, uh, spatial temporal uh, uh, microscopy technique. And here uh, I show you this picture of uh, where you're in the Fermi liquid regime, where you have a relatively large Fermi energy or Fermi temperature and a relatively small uh, uh, electron uh, electronic temperature, which means that you just have like a sharp Fermi drug distribution. In the case where you're closer to the Dirac point, so a smaller Fermi temperature with a relatively large electron temperature, you get the situation where your Fermi drug distribution is so broad that you have this coexistence of holes in the valence band and electrons uh, in the conduction band. And this is where, which gives rise to this quantum critical uh, regime of the direct fluid. So let's uh, look at our data. So we go back to this, to this hydrodynamic window where we have uh, this possibility of being uh, in this either direct fluid or thermoelectric regime. And we're gonna change both of our control knobs of laser power and gate voltage. And first, I'm gonna show you here the two extreme cases where uh, we use either uh, quite low power and a high voltage, so a high Fermi energy. That's both on this side and on this side. And then these two are the opposite regime where we have large laser power and low Fermi energy or low gate voltage or low Fermi energy. And even from the raw data, you see that this spot is larger than this spot. So you really see that during this uh, spatial or this, this temporal window of hydrodynamic transport, you get more heat spreading if you're close to the Dirac point and at strong heating than when you're further away. So that seems to indicate that indeed we can tune between this direct fluid regime 
in this Fermi liquid regime. And we can actually map out the whole system. So you really see that if you plot here uh, the, the spatial width at time zero, you see that it's much larger close to the Dirac point um, and at increasing uh, powers um, than when you go to high doping and low heating power. So this really is an indication that uh, we're really tuning our system from the Fermi liquid regime into the direct fluid regime. So tuning in between these two different hydrodynamic uh, regimes. And this is all at room temperature. So that's something that had never been shown before. So people have done this at very low temperature. It is just, we show this at, at, at room temperature. And this is, this is a quantum critical phenomenon um, that still persists all the way up to, up to room temperature. And actually even higher because our electron temperature is much higher than room temperature. And actually, this is the, the, the crucial way that we can observe it by having such a large electron temperature. Um, and also, uh, we do have clean graphene samples, but these are quite standard now type of samples. So they're poor nitrate encapsulated graphene samples. Um, to add further uh, credibility to our interpretation, we also did uh, these theoretical calculations with Alessandro Principi from the University of Manchester, uh, who calculated uh, the diffusivity as a function of Fermi temperature and electron temperature. And uh, quantitatively or qualitatively, it looks very similar uh, to the experimental data. And what it shows is that in this regime, at the highest um, laser power, the highest electron temperature, and the lowest doping, so the lowest Fermi energy, you get diffusivities exceeding uh, 100,000 centimeters squared per second, which, which is quite a large uh, diffusivity. Um, so again, this is our interpretation. We have this very small, short-lived hydrodynamic window, um, which can carry uh, a lot of heat because the heat uh, diffusivity is up to uh, 100 times higher than in the diffusive regime. So you get this very fast spreading at short time scales, and then you get slower spreading at longer time scales. And because of a pulse duration, we cannot resolve fully these data points starting here and then going up. Um, so it's kind of convoluted. Uh, with our with our uh, time resolution, so that gives you this kind of smooth looking curve that starts at a higher uh, initial value of time zero. So the last thing I wanted to point out here is connecting now to this phonon heat transport, which is that this heat diffusivity, which is extremely efficient, um, can be calculated into a, a electronic thermal conductivity using the heat capacity of the electron system, and this electronic heat capacity scales with temperature. So since we're measuring this at quite high temperature and we have this high diffusivity, it turns out that actually, if you calculate the thermal conductivity uh, in this regime, we end up with a value uh, on the order of more than 10,000 watt per meter Kelvin. So we're moving even more heat with the electrons than we are with the already record high phonon thermal conductivity uh, of, the, of the graphene system. Um, now, this value seems almost crazy, um, but it's actually already predicted some years ago, uh, and even higher values can be reached. So they predict even uh, 100,000 watt per meter Kelvin. Um, and that is just a matter of how close can you get to the Dirac point, and how high can you make your electron temperature. But in principle, it, it diverges. So it goes to infinity if you go towards the Dirac point. Um, of course, it's short-lived. Um, so it's not that you can use this for any application you can, can think of, but uh, it lives for a few hundred femtoseconds and it can actually move heat. Uh, we show this here over micrometers. So if you have very small local hotspots, um, I'm pretty convinced that you can actually use the electronic system of graphene to move heat um, radially out of these small uh, hotspots uh, in your system. Okay, I don't know how I'm doing with time. How much time we have left? How much? Then, ah, perfect, perfect. Okay, so then I have time, uh, yeah, for the third part. So this is this new technique um, that we developed, um, which very much has an analogy with the story I just told you about this electronic heat spreading. Uh, because also now we're going to use this trick of spatial temporal microscopy. So the fact that we dump energy in a system um, or population or heat or whatever you want to call it, and we basically look with high time resolution and high spatial accuracy how this uh, heat uh, is spreading or this population is spreading. And I should point out actually um, that this is a super resolution technique because um, 
let me show you the, um, this picture. So, of course, we're limited by our diffraction limited spot, so around a micron, uh, for where we are dumping this population or heat in the system. But with our second pulse, uh, where we're scanning over this first uh, pulse, we actually have nanometer uh, accuracy and control over scanning over the system. So we're actually limited just by signal to noise in our spatial accuracy. So you can imagine that if you start out with a Gaussian spot of let's say a micron width, that would broaden by just by a nanometer. If you have good enough signal to noise, you will see this one nanometer broadening of your spot. So this uh, actually gives you super, uh, super resolution or differential super resolution uh, in the system. So we can actually see very small uh, amounts of, of broadening. So in this case, for instance, we could see on the order of tens, maybe 10, 20 nanometers of, of broadening uh, in the system in terms of our accuracy. And that's going to help us uh, also in this technique, where we're going to use these type of samples from the first part of my talk, where we have suspended TMD flakes. We now shine our ultra fast laser pulse in the middle, heat starts spreading. With the second pulse, we follow how this heat is spreading. That's the, the basic idea. So this is something we did uh, together with people at the at ICFOL. And of course, the funding. So as I said, uh, we use here the same type of samples. So here's a microscope image of uh, one of these. Uh, so these are commercial substrates, actually. Uh, that have a hole in the center, 50 microns. We put our flake there. It looks like this. And we come with our uh, ultra-fast laser system with two pulses, dumping heat in the center that starts spreading. And then we follow it uh, in time and space with, with our second pulse. So of course, first we can just look at dynamics. So we're not changing now the spatial offset. We're just changing the, the temporal delay between the two pulses. And if you do this outside of the supported, uh, outside of the suspended region, so on the supported region, you see your typical pump probe type dynamics with before time zero, your signal is uh, zero, it goes up at time zero because you're starting to create electronic uh, population, uh, which very quickly became the excitons. And then what you see here in terms of dynamics uh, is the decay of the excitons uh, in, uh, in the system because we're also probing resonantly with the excitons. You have a good uh, sensitivity. Now it looks quite different if you do this on a suspended region. So now we're really doing this pump probe measurements here on the suspended flake. And what you see is uh, most strikingly that you now also have an offset before time zero. And that is because after your electronic system has relaxed, that energy is converted into lattice heat. So we have phonon heat in the system and it doesn't have enough time to fully decay before we start re-exciting the system. So we actually have continuous reheating of our system and not enough time to decay. So we're continuously uh, accumulating heat of the, of the lattice in our system. This is really phonon heat and we're probing it through an electronic transition. And the reason we can do this is that this exciton is very sensitive to the lattice temperature. So it actually shifts. It shifts. Uh, in resonance frequency depending on the temperature quite quite uh, dramatically and that's why we can see that lattice heat by change in reflection uh, of our system even before time zero in this accumulated heat so i'll show that here uh, in a spatial temporal uh, type measurement where you actually see that at time zero you have a narrow uh, peak that's just our diffraction limited spots and before time zero with all this accumulated heat we actually see a much broader uh, spot. And that is because not only are we dumping this heat in the lattice and uh, the phonon system, this also starts spreading. And because this is, in the end, a long measurement, because we're doing this uh, with ultra fast laser pulses, but we're doing it continuously in many milliseconds, and heat has enough time to travel to the edge. It can heat sink, um, and you actually reach a kind of steady state situation, very similar to these Raman thermometry measurements, um, where you actually get a sort of steady state profile. Now, the nice thing is that we can actually uh, resolve the whole profile with our spatial temporal technique. So in that sense, it's a little bit similar to two laser Raman thermometry, where you can also uh, scan um, your spatial profile uh, of your steady state situation. Um, we can also calculate the kind of profile that we are expecting. And it's a relatively simple calculation because all we have to do is solve this heat diffusion equation, uh, which only has one parameter, which is diffusivity. Um, then there's one other parameter that we put into the system, which is the whole the, the whole size, uh, which is this 50 micron uh, uh, diameter, and we put boundary conditions of perfect heat sinking at the edge. 
And with that, we can calculate. Um, okay, we also put in there the repetition rate, which we know very well, 80 megahertz. So we know when we start adding new pulses into the system. And then you can calculate these very nice uh, profiles that, as expected, uh, become broader and broader the higher your diffusivity, because, of course, you have more lateral heat spreading with a higher diffusivity. So this is a spatial temporal uh, way to, to really get a handle on, on this diffusivity. And I will show you that uh, through data. Um, so this is the data we get times zero. So you get something narrow. The width uh, is what we expect based on our spot sizes of both the pump and the probe. And if we do this at pre time zero, so this is the situation where you're probing before your pump comes, which actually probing all this accumulated heat during all these many, many thousands of pulses um, that have been yeah, creating this steady state profile. And you see something that is much broader. Um, and in blue, you see here our data points. And in red, you see our calculation. So this is actually one of the first data I, I got from my lab. So I started building up the lab uh, quite recently. And uh, these were the first data we got from our lab. And, and, and this was the fit. So I, I'm quite proud of this because uh, this is really excellent agreement between a very simple theoretical model and, and this data that, yeah, that we got in our own lab. So we were all very excited when we saw this. Uh, and we can actually use this to, to extract the diffusivity. So as I said, all the parameters are known. So it's the diameter of the, of the hole, it's the repetition rate, it's your initial spot size, and then it's your diffusivity. And that turns out to be around 0.19 centimeters squared per second. Uh, so this is for MOSE2, uh, I think around 12 layers of thickness. And then of course we can use the heat capacity of the system, assuming that it's the same for this multi-layer system as in bulk, and calculate the thermal conductivity. And we get 38 watt per meter Kelvin. So if you remember the values um, we were getting um, for bulk uh, MOSC2, that's pretty much this value. So we actually uh, yeah, show that you can really use this as a quantitative way to extract diffusivity uh, of the system. And it matches with what is expected based on the thermal conductivity. And now it is interesting to measure either thermal conductivity or thermal diffusivity. But the diffusivity is very close to what's really happening microscopically because it's really just you dumping heat somewhere in the sample and that heat spreading. So you get a very microscopic uh, view of how heat is, is moving uh, in the system. Um, so this is the last slide I will show on this. Um, so we have no material input parameters. So that's the big difference with things like Raman thermometry where you need to know the absorption. Um, and if you want to get diffusivity, you need to know the heat capacity. So there's a lot of parameters that, that need to be known uh, to actually get a reliable thermal conductivity. This is also one of the reasons why you have such a large spread in literature, because there's just many, yeah, many parameters going in there. Um, we can do this for very weak heating. So we're only heating up the system a few Kelvin. Rama thermometry, this is in the order of 100 Kelvin. So you really measure this close to, to equilibrium. Uh, the samples are quite simple. The model is quite simple. And we can actually uh, get a quite large dynamic range of diffusivity. So you can really see uh, over orders of magnitude difference in diffusivity uh, from just a spatial profile uh, that you got. So with that, uh, I just show you here the summary. So I showed you uh, phonon heat transport in and out of plane in suspended MOSC2. I showed you this extremely fast short-lived spreading of uh, electronic heat uh, in graphene in this hydrodynamic drug fluid regime. And I showed you here this new technique uh, that we think is very interesting in, in, in using for studying uh, heat transport in thin films. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank you for your time. Thank you.